I used to teach at a school in um, Southern, it's called Southern Hills now. There was a, guy, a couple of young guys in the class there and they formed a band called The Calling of Levi. So I couldn't help but think about that as I was preparing this message. But they've since sort of morphed a little bit and they're now called Pacific. So they're, they're on Triple J and stuff like that, so keep an ear out for them. They're, as far as I can tell, they're good Christian guys, so if you hear them, um, you can listen to their music. But, uh, yeah, so today we're looking at Levi. So let's find out a bit more about him, but before we do that, let's pray. Lord, we pray for open hearts and ears and eyes to see and hear what you have for us this morning. May my words be clear and may um, your spirit speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just imagine... You owned a business, I think like a hardware shop or something, so there's a sign for a hardware shop. That's perhaps one that's been in the family for generations. And as far back as you can tell, your parents and grandparents have run the business from this premises, and you never even thought of doing anything else. Now, I'm not sure if this is true for many people today, this this kind of thing. It's not that kind of faithfulness anymore, but um, just imagine this to make the point. So imagine you have a son who's in his early, early 20s, <clears throat> and he's been working with you for you know, little bits here and there, in between school or whatever, and when he's doing his study, but uh, now he's finished his study, and you're waiting for him, you know, he's going to become a full-time partner, you expect, in the business, just like you did, and just like your dad did, and so on, back down the line. Except one day, he comes in and he tells you that he's decided to take a job at the hardware store down the road. Um, which just happens to be your bit of rival, obviously. Um, now, they've recently come in and they've set up you know, all the fancy with big ads and all that kind of stuff and, and lots of fanfare and, and they're starting to steal your business. So if you imagine that situation, how would you feel about your son? You probably Would you feel a bit betrayed, maybe a little bit angry because you had this expectation? He didn't do it. Well, I think that illustration is perhaps gives you some kind of rough idea about what, how a tax collector was viewed, and especially in the tax collector in our story, Levi. He might have been viewed by the, the Jews of his day. And actually, as I was reading over this message, I realized it's a bit like how the Pharisees saw Jesus as well. But we'll get to that a bit later. But for Levi, as a Jew himself, he had agreed to work for the occupying Roman government. So they'd come in and taken over and he was working for them to collect taxes, to make sure that this corner of the, the little corner of the Roman Empire was, was paying its way. And the way that worked was for the tax collector to, to annually or however often they did it, uh, it was to pay the government the share of taxes that they'd agreed upon. So they sort of have a, have a um, system where they... You know, organise ahead of time an amount to pay back so that then they would collect any extra and keep that for themselves. So, you know, human nature, if you, there's a bit on top, that bit on top you know, demand gets a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more and pretty soon you're, you're pretty rich because you pay your bit to the government and the rest is yours. So you have a, you'd be pretty rich and you'd... Um, at the same time, you'd be hated by, obviously, the locals because you're doing them out of money for just for your own benefit. And, yeah, so it's not just, yeah, you're working for the enemy is one thing, but you're you know, feathering your own nest. So they were pretty much, tax, tax collectors were seen as leeches, sucking people dry for their own benefit. And no one likes people like that, right? No. So we see that Levi then was, was not well liked by the Jews. He was an outcast from Jewish religious life because you know, they'd be actually kept out of the synagogue because they were seen as traitors in a sense. Uh, albeit he'd be a rich outcast. But what else do we know about him? Well, actually he has another name, which is Matthew. Like the book of Matthew. In fact, we're pretty sure this Levi is the guy who wrote the book of Matthew. And his name, Matthew, does anyone know what the name Matthew means? I'm not challenging people on this kind of thing. No? 
It means gift of the Lord, which I think is a pretty appropriate for someone who's, a, who's an apostle and a writer of part of the Bible. He's a, certainly a blessing to us all, even today, all the way through, through church history. And just I noticed here's an interesting side note. Matthew in Hebrew is effectively the same name as Netanyahu, which of course means gift of the Lord as well. I think it's Matitahu, Matisyahu. And then there's a bit of a fiddling around with the, depending on where it came from, but um, it's the same name. Uh, I don't know what you do with that, but just so you know. So Benjamin Netanyahu's name is also Matthew. But what's also interesting is that as a tax collector, one of the necessary skills would be a shorthand writer. So he would write down speech word for word if required. Any, especially ladies here, any could do shorthand? Used to? So not so short anymore, it's a bit, <laughs> no. Well, that's something Matthew would have pro- very likely have done in part of his job. So the theory goes that that's why he has so many long sermons in his gospel, because he could write them all down as, as they were said. So yeah, there you go, that's a little bit about our man Levi or Matthew. So he's the man Jesus approaches as we read this passage, so verse 27. It says, after this, so last week we talked about the healings of the leper and the uh, paralytic. So this is after those. He went out, so Jesus went out, and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. Now, like I mentioned, when we saw the calling of Peter and Andrew a few weeks ago, this probably wouldn't have been the first time Levi had ever seen Jesus. And he certainly... He would have heard about him and uh, the crowds he was drawing because we've seen also that he's been drawing lots of crowds and why he was drawing them and so all the things that Jesus was doing. And think about it, this, this is a guy who would have all the goss, wouldn't he? Because everyone had to report to him at some point. I don't know how many tax collectors they had in the city, but uh, he'd get a good cross-section of people coming through. So he'd hear all the stories and all the reports about Jesus. So he would have had plenty of time to weigh up the accounts and, and think about all the implications of what, who this Jesus was and what he was doing, which may have been another reason God inspired him to write the book of Matthew, because he had all that you know, extra connections and knowledge. But the fact that when Jesus called him, he simply up and walked out from behind his tax desk, never to return, was quite an amazing thing. Think, think about that. Not only was he leaving a good source of income, very good source of income. And with it, all the powerful connections he would have. But he knew this was it. He was never going back. Because there's no way that anyone could just up and walk out from a Roman government position and expect to step in one day. Now you get the big black, if you had Texter, I'm sure they'd cross his name out. But he got a black mark next to his name. As far as guys like Pontius Pilate would be concerned, certainly. Not sure if Pontius Pilate was his boss, but anyway, those kind of senior officials. Because even the Greek wording, um, it, it stresses the clean break that Levi was making. Now, there's a bit of, I'll do a little bit of Greek today, I hope that's all right, but I'll try and explain why. It's helpful. So the Greek explains here, because in that verse, and left everything he wrote, and leaving everything, sorry, he rose and followed him. So the leaving everything is an aorist participle. I bet you knew that. No? Yeah. <laughs> Aorist participle, which literally means upon leaving. So or even the idea would be having left. So having left, so that's done. That's the whole idea of the aorist participle there. So that bit was done, the break was made. And then followed him is in the imperfect tense, meaning it's a continual state of his life after that time. So it was literally he was following So you could say, and having left the tax desk there and everything, he rose and was following Jesus as an ongoing thing. He didn't just like follow him down the shops and then that's it. He was an ongoing thing. Now, I don't know about you, but on the surface, I'd find it extremely hard to leave a highly paid job in the middle of a work day, presumably, and commit myself to a guy who materially had nothing. But this was the call of Jesus. And to make it more pointed for us, it's still the call of Jesus. Could you give up everything to follow Jesus? 
because most of us today don't need to give up as much as Levi did, at least not in the initial part. But certainly in the end we need to realise that all we have and all we are, that's what we place in Jesus' hands when we commit to following him. And we have no business trying to take it back, despite the fact that I'm sure we all do at times. We say, oh, just this little bit, I'll take care of that for now, Jesus. But no, we've got to give everything over. Now, I won't ask you to put your hands up, but just look within your own heart and can you honestly say you are all in for Jesus Christ like this? Or do you find him kind of interesting, maybe even fascinating? But you just want to keep a hand in the world too because it's it's quite nice because you enjoy that. Well, this is what people, this is what Jesus says to people who think like this in Luke 9, 62. No one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Because I've mentioned before that I believe we're now entering into a time of history where there is a great polarisation occurring. So that means the sides of the battle are being more clearly defined now. So the question is going to be more and more, which side are you on? If you don't deliberately choose Jesus' side, you'll by default end up on the other side because we're born on the other side and we need to move over at some point. But we don't want to end up on the other side. That doesn't end well. I'm sure we all know about what that involves. So, But if you choose Christ, if you're willing to leave it all for him, then you might be excited enough to make a big deal out of it. Some people are, and Levi did in verse 29. And Levi made a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. So Levi gathered all his mates, so all his, you could say, dodgy friends perhaps. At least that's how the Jews would have seen it. And he was celebrating his new life with them. And I'm quite sure there's a bit of, you know, hey, come and meet this Jesus guy, sort of about the, whole, about the whole thing. And like I said, we'll get to a bit of Greek here again. So the word others there is quite specific in Greek. Because Greek has two words for others, alos and heteros. This is alos, which means others of the same kind. So we're talking about other mis- misfits and Jewish cultural rejects as well. So just so the Greek makes it clear it's not just a general population coming in. He's called his... his the same type as him into the, to the group. So, because that's clear from the Greek, it's all the misfits and all the dodgy ones, can you imagine what the Jewish leaders thought about this, Jesus meeting with them? Well, actually, you don't have to imagine because he tells you in verse 30. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now, I don't, this is something I hadn't really noticed. Who, who are they talking to? Who are the Pharisees addressing? The disciples. Yeah. So, this and that, so notice this wouldn't actually have been at the dinner. Okay, this is a bit afterwards, because there's no way the Pharisees would be caught dead at this dinner. But this, so there's afterwards, and then they came whinging to Jesus' disciples. So why didn't they come to Jesus directly? Let's turn the question back on ourselves, and I'm, I'm certainly addressing myself as much as anyone here. So why do we so often try and deal with a problem by going to those around it, but not talking to the actual person? I guess we're scared to feel uncomfortable just looking at myself, why I don't do that sometimes, and that's because we're uncomfortable, aren't we? The right thing to do, though, is if you have a problem with someone, go and talk to them directly. And sure, sometimes we do need to get advice before we do that, so... In, Sometimes you do need to talk to other people and, and be considerate about that. But we still need to try and make sure we sort out the problem with the source, not peripheral people. So I'm sure you get what I mean on that. I think we all have, have a hard time sometimes with that. So they went to his disciples, but Jesus, being Jesus, he knows what's going on. He speaks up anyway to take the heat off the disciples a bit, I think. Who might have? I don't know how they would have answered the question. They might have been a bit stuck on the answer, I think. So Jesus steps in and he says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So you may remember, but probably not, that last year I gave an example about someone who needs to be saved is like a person with a snake bite. So that's why I've got the picture up there. 
So a person with a snake bite needs anti-venom venom to live. But if they don't think they've been bitten or if they don't think the bite is bad enough, then they won't bother looking for a remedy, will they? They'll just keep going as they are because, you know, it's just a snake bite that didn't get me. And the remedy which we sang about before is applying Jesus' blood, isn't it? It's your blood that cleanses me and, and all that. So that's, that's the remedy. So we have to remember that. But that's kind of the idea here, I think, I would argue. The sick are those who are bitten, but in the way Jesus is saying it, it's the ones who know they are bitten and acknowledge that they need to be healed of it. So these are the kinds of lost people Jesus came to save. Those who think they are all good, they don't need a saviour, then Jesus is, you could say, wasting his time on them almost. Uh, don't take that too literally, but you know, you know what I mean on that, I think. So I suspect there's actually a bit of irony here as well, that Jesus is having a dig at the Pharisees without them realising. If you look at what he says there, because they considered themselves the healthy ones, didn't they? Because you know, they, they tick, ticked all the boxes, they did all the right things, and then some. But Jesus is saying to them, hey, I'm not going to concern myself with you so much since you're so healthy. And then he continues in that vein in the next verse, verse 32. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So it, it's clever in more ways than one there, I think. So that face value, the Pharisees think Jesus is telling them that he's come to deal with the sick, the poor dregs of society by their me measurement. So don't bother him while he goes about his treatment. That's what Pharisees think Jesus is saying. You know, he's, oh yeah, that's okay. You can go deal with the, the, the sick people. That's all right. So he disarms the human argument there in doing that. But he's also talking at the deeper level, I think, at the same time, saying that it's your own view of yourself that's crucial there, how you view your own sinfulness. If you see yourself as not needing a doctor, then you won't call for one, will you? Even, even if you are dying, but you, you don't think you are, then you won't call for one. But if you realise that the snake got you good, that you're going to die eternally if you don't get help, that you're a sinner, basically. Basically, then Jesus will happily help you. But you have to acknowledge that. Just like the leper and the paralytic last week, they came and came before Jesus because they needed help. They saw it as, a, as their need. So you have to let Jesus help you, in a sense. So the reason for that, partly, is that God is a gentleman. He doesn't intrude where you put up walls to keep him out he'll knock and sometimes sometimes he'll knock pretty loudly but if you just won't release your life to him he'll move on he often comes back and have another knock and he'll he doesn't give up but you know if you if you push him away he'll say okay i'll give you some space and the reason he does that is that the kingdom of god is all about faith isn't it if you don't believe, if you don't have faith, then you don't belong. Now, I realise putting it that way sounds a little harsh perhaps. But let's put it another way. And this is the Bible's words this time. In verse 6 of Hebrews 11. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you think about it, it's saying the same thing. You need faith to please God. So in this scenario, if we think back to the party... It was Levi and all the rotten tax collector buddies who had faith. Well, we don't actually we don't know if his buddies had faith, but we know Levi did. Let's, let's just focus on Levi. He had faith, so he saw his need and believed, while the self-righteous Pharisees didn't. So who was well and who was sick? Well, I'll let you figure that one out. Um, actually, no, let's, let's just talk about it. So Levi, Levi was well, wasn't he? Well, he was made well by Jesus. And the Pharisees were sick, still stuck and blinded by their own pride. So in short, they hadn't repented. Now Luke is, has far more to say about repentance than any other gospel writer, by quite a way too. So since we will encounter it a bit more in the book of Luke, I thought I'd just put a moment into talking about the idea of repentance. What does it mean? 
And uh, in dealing with repentance, we'll deal a little bit with faith as well. So just that's what's coming up now. Now here's the Greek again. It's the word metanoia. And that comes from meta, meaning after. And noia from the word nous, you know, where we word nous for, for your thinking, for your mind. So it literally means to think again or to change your mind, some say. Now, because of this, there's some teachers who really water down what repentance is. They say, you just need to learn to think differently about yourself. And you'll realize how wonderful you are and that you can do all things if you just attach the name of Jesus to your life. But this, I'm sure you can realize that is totally worldly thinking. And actually, ironically, demonstrating no true change of mind, no, no renewal of mind there at all. The change of thinking God is after is not in regard to yourself. Though that may come later as you, as you grow and you learn what it means to be, to be loved by God, to be cherished by Him and to be an eternal son or daughter of the Almighty God. That's when the change in how you see yourself comes. But true saving repentance, so that is at the point of conversion to Christ, is a repentance of faith or a repentance by faith. So, when we talk about faith, then, faith is not some abstract thing that we try to muster up, is it? We can't just, oh, I've just got to have more faith. Ever notice that doesn't work very well? Faith has an object. So let's explain it like this. Now, I might have faith that this lectern can hold my notes. And I do. I might have faith that you guys aren't going to fall asleep on me this morning. Or I might have faith that a, a big gorilla is going to come in this morning and give me a banana. Now, these are three completely different things, okay, obviously. No matter what I believe about these things, some are more likely and some are less likely. That's self-evident, right? Yeah. Even though I personally might believe each of those things is, is true, okay? They have equal chance of happening. But the point is, it's the object of my faith that matters. It's not what I believe about it. It's the actual object itself. Okay? So I'm happy to have faith that this lectern will do its job this morning because this object of my faith has proven itself you know, since I've been here. <laughs> it's always held up my notes. It hasn't collapsed yet. So it's proven itself as pretty reliable. Now I'm a little less likely <laughs> to put my faith in the idea that no one will fall asleep because, no offense, everyone has bad days. We all know that. And hey, you've got to listen to me waffle on for 40 minutes, so hey, maybe it's partly my fault too. But I'm not ever going to put my faith in a gorilla coming in to give me a banana. Obviously that's silly. Because why would you put your faith in something that's never going to happen, right? It just can't stand up to the weight of my expectation, no matter how strong your expectation might be. So for that reason... You can't just believe things into being, can you? It's, it's about the thing itself. So I say all that to get back to the idea of repentance by faith. Okay. So what is the object of your faithful repentance? It's not ourselves, is it? It's not just trying to realize how wonderful we are and because the object then would be our fallen and fallible selves. <coughs> and that would be like the guy on the left there, wouldn't it? Left in that picture up on the screen. It's about repentance, a new way of thinking, about Jesus Christ. That's what repentance is about. That's the object that repentance is concerned about. It's a person, it's him. So if you're having trouble kicking bad habits and repenting from sins that just hang on to you, or often more we hang on to them, the problem is, what you believe about Jesus. That's the problem. Or more precisely, how well you know him. It's not just abstract belief. It's how well you know him. So that means, what, if you're having trouble in that way, that means there's a flaw somewhere that needs to be ironed out by God's Spirit, usually working through prayer or study of his word and you know, loving advice from fellow Christians or a combination of all three, obviously. All those things can help us see where that flaw is. Because perhaps you don't fully trust Jesus' power to heal you forever. Well, he, he does it all the time, and the Bible's full of examples. 
Perhaps you don't fully trust Jesus' love. But he died for you. Let's keep that in mind. Well, perhaps you don't fully trust Jesus' forgiveness. Well, again, that's the cross, isn't it? It's he up there on the cross. He forgave us. It's done. So whatever it is that you don't quite uh, have straight about Jesus, it's, it's the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ that's the path to wholeness. The, uh, the shalom, wholeness. And when you've repented, and I'm talking about the once for all sense here, when you first become saved, then your thinking changes from, I don't care what I do wrong, to, hey, I actually agree with Jesus that what I'm doing is wrong and it has to go. So it's a change in direction. It's a 180 degree turn in living for yourself to living for God. So your mind and heart are now aligned in the right direction even if your behaviour is yet to change. Because that's, that's the idea. You, you're agreeing with God that what this thing I'm doing is, is wrong. And that doesn't mean it will instantly change in your life but you're just any time you do it you're agreeing okay, this is wrong. I've got to you don't beat yourself up, but you do work hard to try and keep handing it over to Jesus. And every time it happens, it's a reminder that you need to do it again. Now, this is what I'm trying to avoid this being like too much of a theory thing. I'm trying to make it very practical. So I hope you can see the practicality. Because the practical part is that we need to live for Christ in this world, don't we? But we fail so often. So we're timid, or we mess up, or we get angry. But the answer to these is always a confession of sin and a pursuit of a deeper personal knowledge of Jesus. So he comes in and sorts out our mess. And he's the only one who can. But it does take time. But we need to repent for that to happen. So we need to agree with him that, like I said, certain things have to go in our lives. And then work hard with him in achieving victory over those things. And one of those ways we can develop strength to overcome in this life is the topic of the next section of our passage today, which is talking about fasting. That's one way we can develop some strength. So fasting can teach you self-control and patience and loads of other things, but it has a time and place. And that's what we read from verse 33, the time and place for fasting. Verse 33, And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, that's John the Baptist, by the way. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. You know, they're having parties. What's going on? And Jesus said to them, Can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? So the Pharisees, I think they realized they were beaten on the first point that they made to the, to the disciples on why Jesus ate with sinners. So they tried this angle now. Basically, you guys aren't pious enough, Jesus. They have too much fun, basically. That can't be true religion. Well, that's right. It's not religion in the human sense. It's a relationship, isn't it? That's the difference, religion versus relationship. And that's the line Jesus takes with them in the answer, isn't, isn't it? If you look at that, do you see that? It's not just any relationship. This is the, the top of all relationships, marriage, the most intimate one. In fact, it's even more intimate there than the, the ESV translation that we're looking at there. It carries over. It's, uh, the word isn't really wedding guests as such. It's literally sons of the bridal chamber or the honeymoon suite, if you like, in, in modern language, which is, of course, where the Hebrew marriage was consummated. So you don't need for me to give you any more details on that. You know what that means? So this would be the image that Jesus was presenting to the Pharisees. And it's very appropriate because we are, as the church, the bride of Christ, aren't we? Ephesians talks about that. That is, we're currently engaged to be married to him, in a sense, which is what something, you know, the idea of what we talked about in communion this morning, of being engaged to be married. So when you're with your fiancé, how can you even think about fasting? Because that's associated more with discipline and austerity and all those kinds of things. No, you just want to enjoy their company. So having a feast is a perfect thing to do, really. So, Because God's not an ogre who wants us to always have a stern look in our face and be scared of a good time. 
as long as the celebration is appropriate and obviously we don't overdo anything and just make it all about satisfying your own pleasure, that's, that's not the kind of celebration God likes. But, but we are free to celebrate because we've got lots to celebrate. But it's not always a good time to party. So Jesus tells them when it's appropriate to fast. Verse 35. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. So is that the time we're in now? Yep, it is. So that's not to say, like I said, we can't celebrate because we have a lot to thank God for and celebrate together with and we should do that often. But since Jesus our groom is away, it's just as fitting to fast as well. But also with the view that the real celebration, the wedding and the feast, is still coming, the proper one, the real big one. Now as we finish and look at our, to finish our look at the passage today, we see Jesus giving two different but complementary symbols or representative stories perhaps um, in the form of a parable from verses 36 to 39. And each of them is designed to highlight the difference between the new way in Christ and the old way in Judaism. Or even not just Judaism, perhaps any system where it's about religion and not relationship. And we, we mentioned a few of those a few weeks ago. We talked about some other religions. So in the first symbol there, we have one where someone cuts out part of new clothing, so like cut their old jeans or whatever, and sewed that onto a Um, old piece of clothing to fix a hole but as Jesus says in verse 36 if you do that you've only you've not only wrecked the new clothes by cutting out the the patch and but also the new patch will never really match the old thing that you're trying to patch firstly and secondly it still has to shrink so uh, when it does it will tear away this from the stitching so you'll have wrecked both clothes. Now, we mostly have pre-shrunk stuff these days, so it doesn't not quite the same. But in those days, that was certainly, if you put something new on something old, it would just tear off. So in this story, the idea is the old just can't handle the dynamic nature of the new. And the reason Jesus used this parable is because he can see that the Pharisees are not able to comprehend the new way that Jesus was seeking to bring because they didn't recognize that you know, they were having a celebration and it was okay. Because what they were sticking to, the old way of Judaism, was never intended to be the once and for all system of God's dealing with people. Jeremiah 31 is a, is a, a good chapter that tells all about that. And so they should have been ready. They were, they were very you know, up to speed with the Old Testament, obviously. Because Jeremiah 31, 33 says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. So this is a completely different thing to trying to follow all the external rules, isn't it? When it's on your heart. Um, Because the external rules is what the Pharisees were trying to do. So the question is, then what good is the Old Testament law then? Well, the Bible describes it as a little bit like a a school teacher or a nanny perhaps. It's kind of the word that he uses there. Um, someone who has charge over you for a little while and then hands you over to your parents when the time comes. So that's from Galatians 3.24. That's what Paul's image there is like a school teacher or nanny. And then there's another image in Hebrews 9 verses 9 to 10. I'll put that up there. That's where we read this. So according to this arrangement, that is talking about the old covenant, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipper but deal only with food and drink and various washings, so external stuff, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. That's not the Reformation, um, because I would argue the idea behind the word Reformation there is more the idea of renovation. It's like the old law was the foundation, and then the law of Christ builds on that and fulfills it. So, I mean, we're talking about renovating the manse, well... We've got the existing thing there. We're going to put some new stuff in it. That's the idea of the renovation that is that the, the law of Christ is. It's a new way of, of uh, filling out what's already there. So the law of Moses was not an end point. 
but it was really designed to point the Jews to Jesus. And all those symbols that we talk about in the Old Testament, and I'll keep bringing them out as, once we get back into the Old Testament again, everyone else um, is, is the same really, that they, they should have recognized when Jesus came because they'd all pointed to Jesus, all those Old Testament um, symbols. Unfortunately, the vast majority got distracted in the details and missed his arrival. And most of the Jews are still waiting even today. Well, those that have any awareness at all, anyway. But most of the, yeah, those Jews are, that are sort of Judaism today are still looking for the Messiah. Anyway, that's, that's the point of the symbol of the patch, anyway. Uh, which was the, way, the new way that Jesus is, is, a, is a different type to the old. And they shouldn't really coexist, those two, two uh, dispensations, if you like which is pretty much the same idea behind the second symbol, which is that of wine being poured into old wineskins. Now, I'm, I don't know much about wineskins, but I think that's an old one, judging by the wrinkles. Now, just to explain that a little bit, it's a bit like people, is it? No. <laughs> no, the ancient Jews would tend to use goat skins, so they'd clean them up a bit and then gather them together and put the wine in them. Um, so like I said, you can see that in the picture. Now, this one's pretty dried out. That's why I'm saying I assume it's an old one. But a new wine skin would be fairly soft and stretchy, as you can imagine. So for those of skinned animals, you know how the skin is quite soft and stretchy. So when you put new wine into it, it would produ and, and new wine produces gas as it ferments and, and it expands, therefore, and the, and the wine skin would stretch with that and all would be fine. So you'd be all right. You'd get no leaks. But if you put new wine into a wine skin like that one, then the wine, as the wine expands, has got nowhere to go and it would split and start to leak out and you'd lose all your wine. So Jesus is saying, this is like trying to constrain the gospel of the new covenant within the old ways. We'll only destroy what tries to constrain it. So only a new heart will do. But the Pharisees still had an old heart, a heart of flesh or a heart of stone. So they were only attracted to the old ways. So they thought they had all the answers. Yeah, so they look, see, it's all written down here. This is the answers. But even though Jesus proved time and again that they didn't. So that's why Jesus ends off his story with this line in verse 39. And no one after drinking old wine desires the new, for he says the old is good. So some translations try and make that say the old is better. I think that's what I think the NIV might have. But it's not so much about comparison, about comparing the old to the new. It's more about simply ignoring the new and rejecting it simply because they, what they think they have is fine. See, so that's the idea of, no, we've always done it this way, so it's, it's good. We'll stick with it. I don't, don't, don't even bother me with the new stuff. But Jesus is trying to tell them, hey, the whole thing is supposed to point to me anyway, so you're missing it. So since Jesus leaves them with that kind of challenge, can I leave that with you as well? Are you still trying to earn God's favour? A bit like that wineskin in the picture there. Do you, are you, do you still think that God will love you a bit more if you just clean yourself up a bit more? Is that how you think it works? Are you not ready to stretch? Or do you look down on others because you're further along the road than them? All these kinds of things are what Jesus, I think, is picturing here. And what he's trying to get rid of here, trying to point out that we've got to change that. We don't have to do religion to get to God. We can enjoy the relationship, have a celebration, because Jesus has done it all. But, of course, once we do that, we need to keep in mind the phrase, until he comes. And we remind ourselves that we still have work to do, and we fast, and we still have hard times, while, while we're here and he's not, or well, his spirit's with us, of course, but he's physically not here yet. But it's not a drudgery of trying to earn favour. That's not what we're trying to do. We have his favour if we believe in him. So we go and encourage each other and tell others about him because we love him. And we're eagerly expecting to see him soon and we want everyone to join us. So how would that look for you in your life? So as we close now, just take a minute to think about what difference it would make in practical terms if you live in that loving faithfulness of a, of a new wineskin to Jesus, loving thankfulness to Jesus, rather than worried striving to earn his favour. So just take a moment.
think about what different things in, in your life which might be in either category and just, just pray that over for a moment, okay? Dear Lord, the, the new way in Christ, Lord, it's, it's difficult for our, well, it's impossible for our old selves to, to actually comprehend it, Lord. You need to put the, the knowledge into us and the heart into us, Lord, to be able to accept it. So, Lord, thank you that you do that as we repent and we trust you. Everything comes from you, Lord. We thank you for that and we pray that as we grow in this knowledge and, and faith in you, that these new wineskins will stretch to, to handle all the things that you have for us. Help us to just release those things to you that are holding us back, that are condemning us. Lord, there's no condemnation when we're in Christ Jesus. So we thank you for this new way. We thank you that we have the blessings of a relationship with you and thank you that we can share it with others. Help us to do that and encourage each other. In Jesus' name, amen.